Hello everyone and welcome back to Banjo Kazooie on the Nintendo 64. I am one world sheep yet again. I don't know why I'm going into this voice and sounding a little bit like Darth Sidious. Good Anakin, good. Kill him. <laughs> You'll take my rightful place in the dark side. But speaking of dark side, this year is Gruntilda's good sister, Brentilda. And uh, she's basically going to give us some random, random information about Gruntilda throughout the course of the game. For example, she washes her hair with engine oil. And uh, she gets her clothes from the trash can. Now, why do we need to know this information? Good question! I am not going to tell you yet, but what I do recommend is go and find her whenever you can and basically talk to her and write down what she says because the information she gives you is semi-randomized every single playthrough. She will always give you different information every different time you load up a new save file in this game. So just pay attention to what she tells you, write it down in a notepad, you're going to need it for... Not right away, but for the final boss, you will need this information to get past. Or at least have an easy time getting through anyway. It's possible without the information, but it helps. Oh, it does help. Anyway, coming down here, we've activated a magic cauldron. This is basically our teleportation thingy, and right behind it, which you probably can't see, is a mumble token, so be sure to pick that up. But uh, get two of the same color throughout Gruntilda's lair, and we'll have the ability to teleportation! through different areas of the castle. You know, folks, we'll be able to go from point A to point B in the castle a lot quicker. It's kind of helpful. I, I never really use these teleporters because I honestly forget they're there. But if you remember they're there, they are very useful. You know, they, they can be a very good time saver. You know, they can get through the areas a lot quicker. But now that we have access to the next world of the games, just head down into this area and here it is. Jump into the giant treasure chest and into Treasure Trove Cove we go. I gotta be honest, I find Treasure Trove Cove to be the best level in the game, honestly. This is my absolute favourite level out of all the levels in the game. And I think it's because the it's got a perfect size and the way it's structured makes it really easy to just go back to and explore multiple times, you know? But to start things off, we need to jump off the entrance bridge thingy and jump in the water. And you might hear that very ominous music. And if you didn't hear that ominous music, because I'm talking, sorry. <laughs> if you're playing the game, you'd hear it. Um, basically, that's music that indicates that a shark's going to try and eat you. When you and it, obviously, if he catches you, it's going to hurt. You know, you're going to lose a bit of health. And I'm going to talk more about that shark in a bit. But first things first, this here is Nipper. Whenever you run into Nipper, basically, Kazooie's gonna flat out insult him, which is a trait that Kazooie's, Kazooie sort of keeps throughout the entire game, you know, keeps throughout the entire series now that I think about it. But uh, just peck Nipper three times, wait for his claws to move out of the way, and we can be able to go inside of Nipper's shell. What? Hang on, where did Nipper go? He was huge. How, did, where did he go? Did he sort of. Oh my god. We hit him so hard he turned into two mini normal crabs. Kazooie, you evil person! Now, honestly, I don't know when Nipper went, and 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 just and I'm theorizing that those two crabs did a fusion dance or used the Patara earrings from Dragon Ball or something and became Nipper. That's I'm, I'm that's my story. I'm sticking to it. But anyway, coming here for a bunch of uh, jiggy for a jiggy and a bunch of notes anyway. So there, yeah, there's that. But uh, before we move on, that pad below is an ability we're going to be getting in this world. That green pad, if you just saw it. And down here is where the honeycomb piece, where I don't really like this honeycomb location, cause just because it's very easy for the shark to really nip you and give you a good old, give you a good old nibble on the buttocks, you know. And no one likes to be nibbled on the buttocks, unless of course you're into that kind of thing. And in that case, to each their own, I suppose. But uh, I digress. Anyway, because I was watching um, Clement's LP of this game not too long ago, just to get in, you know, just to sort of get in the mood to do this LP myself, I was actually, ever since I watched his LP of this game, whenever I see that shark now, I can't help but think of the shark having his really obnoxious, posh voice now, thanks to him. Mmm, 
yeah, Snacker needs some dinner. Mmm, fetch me some bear with caviar. Mmm, yes. <laughs> but, um... I digress. Anyway, popping onto this treasure ship right here. This here is Captain Blubber. He's going to be appearing in pretty much every game in the Branjo... Branjo? Banjo franchise from this point onwards. And what he basically wants us to do is collect... Collect his treasure that he sort of... Misplaced. As pirates tend to do. You know, although pirates tend to draw maps to their treasure. This guy is a bit... I assume he's geogra... Geogra... He's not good at map making. There we go. That, that's an easier word to say than geographical. Geographic. In fact, I don't even know what word I'm trying to say. Either way, we've got access to a brand new ability by here. This is the ability to actually fly. You know, obviously we're playing as a bear or with a bird in his backpack. You, you, it'd be kind of stupid to have the, have a bird that can't fly as one of the main characters. You know, folks. So here we go. We can now fly in this game, and it takes up our feathers red feathers which are items we've been we're gonna be able to collect now from this point onwards and basically it takes up a feather every second when you're flying I believe and whenever you push the A button to go higher we're gonna see more of that later on but first things first let's break into the ship yar Miati's gonna go swimming for sunken treasure ahoy there I be blubber's treasure <laughs> oh god I really hope that wasn't too loud for my microphone but uh, yeah, basically it's two pieces of golden treasure that Blubber misplaced. God knows how he managed to misplace it. I'd be a bit more protective if it was... I'm really having bad with words today, aren't I? I would be a lot more protective if I if it was my treasure, I'm going to be honest. So just grab the treasure from inside the ship below there. And you might be wondering where the second half of the treasure is. Well, right down here. Wait, didn't Blubber say he can't swim? He's a pirate. <laughs> You'd assume a sailor would learn to swim just out of principle. Unless I'm I completely... Did he say that? Because I could be wrong. Oh, it doesn't matter anyway. Just grab the other treasure and give it to good old Blubber. Because it's just another MacGuffin to collect another MacGuffin, you know, folks. It's, uh, it's all good. It's all good. But I have to say, this world is one of my favorite worlds in the game just because of the music. And just the level design as a whole is really... It's really vast without being too obnoxious about it, you know, folks? It's just, I don't know, the music is glorious as well. Like I said, Grant Kirkhope, I'm starting to get the hang of saying his name now. He, he did such a good job at making this game. Soundtrack, you know? I almost almost gave the game credit, the entire credit of the game to him. He didn't make the whole game, God, it'd be impressive if he did. But, um... No, the soundtrack he did with this game is just godlike, you know? Banjo Kazooie is one of those games that I really consider to have a perfect soundtrack, and there's not many games that I would consider to have that. I mean, there's Sonic 2, there's this game, and I think that's pretty much just about it. There's really not many games that I can consider that, to have that good soundtrack. And Grunty's, Grunty's line there really confused me. Now harder still, the game will be. <laughs> that, that, why don't you make the game harder in the first place, you know, Grunty? If you have the ability to, are you just being a good sport or something? Uh, I don't know. Where it Either way, just continue onwards up by here. Be sure to climb up on all the trees whenever you can. And that island there, in your, if you have a stock copy of this game, first bought, you will not be able to gain access to that island. I have access to that island because of certain reasons, and I'm going to talk about those reasons later on in the game, and I don't want to talk about it too much, but simply put, we are not visiting that island during the course of this LP. Anyway, this here, folks, is one of the most useful abilities we learn from bottles. This is the shock jump. Whenever you find a giant green pad floating around the level, just hold down the A button while you're on the pads, and you'll send yourself up flying miles away. And it, it, basically, there's quite a few platforming sequences that require the use of this, you know, folks? And uh, when we jump downwards, we'll see Leaky just uh, shit a couple of eggs into his bucket, and we'll have access to the sandcastle. And this is one of the biggest areas, well, not really the biggest areas. This is one of the most important, that's a better better description, areas of this game. Because, well, this is where we go to enter cheats. Now, you might be wondering, why do you want to cheat? I don't. I'm not going to cheat through this playthrough. 
but there are certain codes that you can get in this game as unlockables and those codes I will be using. They are called cheats as well but they're not really cheats as much as they are power-ups so I have no real quarrel in using them. But yeah this is where you enter cheat codes, this is where you enter loads of uh, words and stuff to get different effects you know folks. And just basically to get through this the first time we need to see the wall says Banjo Kazooie. Just write that down using the tiles and the gate will open up allowing us to take on the black crab by here who honestly is the biggest challenge in the entire game. Oh my god, that was so difficult. <laughs> no, seriously, he goes down without a fight. I don't know, I don't know why they sort of tried to make him a bit more intimidating. But uh, take him down, jump up, get the jiggy and uh, be sure to check out the corners of this room. One of the big problems with some of these rooms is the camera tends to get fixed at certain points. So you need to go to each of the corners of the room just to make sure that there's no hidden jigsaw piece or musical note hidden in the corner just out of your reach from the normal camera because you know sometimes they do that and it can be a bit annoying but basically safety is a good thing in this game folks you know it's always good to be safe always good to check your boundaries check the corners and to you first things first we use this first shock jump sprint by here to get ourselves the first of many mumbo tokens in this world I say that but I don't I we may have picked some up already I'm not actually I'm not really paying too much attention to the collectibles we pick up, to be honest. As long as I collect the main things, that's all that really matters to me. Because when I say I'm doing this, I'm doing this playthrough 100%, so I'm getting every note, every jiggy in the game. But Mumbo Tokens, I don't know where they all are, and I'm not collecting them all because they don't actually count towards 100% completion. I'm co collecting enough so I can get all, all the transformations, and that's all that matters to me, you know, folks? <laughs> But anyway, using the shock jumps, you can jo shock spring jump pads, you can jump up to that jiggy, and uh, it's, it's a pretty easy one to get. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is still early days. This is still where the game's difficulty is really low. You know, anyone can pick up this game and play it. Like, I used to play this when I was young. I used to love it. I didn't even collect things when I was young. I just used to love exploring, and that's one of the big things I really... Oh god, snack is back. Yippee, snack gets dessert too. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help but do that voice. But yeah, this is this isn't a hard game, you know, folks. This is a pretty easy pick up and play game. There's only one level in this entire game that I would really consider to be difficult. That and the final boss fight, which isn't really difficult, it's more of a challenge, but you might be wondering what am I doing at the minute? Well, I'm actually looking for a honeycomb piece. Now, I know where the honeycomb piece is, but the problem is it's on a box that's in the middle of the ocean somewhere randomly. And the big problem with this box is in the middle of the ocean is it suffers from popping. Like I said in a previous episode, there's a lot of popping issues in this game, and for the most part, the game's good enough that you don't need to worry about it. But this is one of those worlds where it's such a nightmare because you try looking for all these items and stuff and because it's such a wide area to cover sometimes the item when the items you're looking for will just not appear on screen even if you're looking at the correct area where they're meant to be and this is a problem that's sort of solved in the like so you can see the notes popping in right now this is a problem that's solved in the xbox live hd redone version of this game but you know, I want to take on a classic game, you know, I want to show you guys the classic as I was grown up with, you know, I, I want to show you guys the true amazing experience that we all got back in the day. But yeah, definitely, if you want to pick this up and you don't want to have the issues this game has, which it mainly is draw distance issues, then I really do recommend picking up the... Picking up the Xbox Live Arcade version of the game, you know, folks, because it's easy. It's just easier to collect all the MacGuffins in that version. It's... And one thing I haven't really spoke about is, if I were to die right now and leave the level, all of the items I picked up to this point, except for the jiggies, I would have to pick them all up again, because the way this game sort of works is, whenever you pick up certain notes, it gets added to a total high score. And obviously you get 100 notes in total in each world and you need that. Basically a high score then corresponds to the amount of notes you've picked up overall and you can use the high score to open up the note doorways. So 
basically all the notes in the level will respawn if you die, exit the level and re-enter. You know folks, it, so try for the love of god not to die, because if you die you have to recollect everything in the stage again and it can make a very short level really long, you know folks, like this, is a, this level will take me around 20 to half hour, 20 minutes to half hour at most, you know. If I were to die, that would be about, that would be an hour for this one level, you know, it, it it's a bit of an annoying issue and I, I th they do rectify this in Banjo Tui in the N64 version, but for that reason alone I just say if you want to pick up this game, get the Xbox version, you know. Unless of course you want the true original experience, then pick up the N64 version because the controller suits it more. That's just my opinion of that, mind you, because everyone has their own opinions with these sort of things. And the, 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 the Xbox Live version of the game does have a fair share of issues too, like... Like, the first cutscene has an issue with stuttering, I've noticed, and... I've seen playthroughs of the Xbox version on YouTube, and that doesn't seem to happen on their version, so it might just be a problem I'm having with my Xbox in particular, but I don't know, I digress. Anyway, that's a bit of a evilly placed Jinjo there, just be careful not to fall off, pick up the Jinjo, and let's just move on. And needless to say, if you want to grab on, if you want to touch these mines, don't, because the mines will explode, and explosions are no good. They're gonna take down your health, yo. I also don't understand why this game has a life system. Because when you die, everything gets reset anyway. So, the life system, I, I, I just assume it's there just for the sake of having lives. Because there's really no need for a live system in this type of platformer, you know, where all the challenge is collecting things and exploring, not from the actual platforming itself. Granted, you do get challenging platforming sequences, but that's not the main thing. Anyway, you might be wondering what I'm doing with these red crosses around. Well, basically, what you need to do is ground pound each of these red crosses, and they will th in give you an arrow into pointing you into the next area in which you need to go. Follow the arrow, and it's a bit like a treasure map, you know, you just follow the arrow and you'll find yourself some buried gold, quite literally. And what is the buried gold we're gonna get? Well, obviously, it's a jiggy. I mean, come on, come on, what do you think they'll throw at us? A golden jinjo or something? Ha! Huh. No, they're gonna throw us a, they're gonna throw a jiggy at us. So just keep ground pounding all these X's when you come across them, and... What I advise is not to take the flight pad and fly across this area by here because it's very easy to miss out on all these notes if you do so. So just walk across this walkway and uh, you'll thank me for it. Just trust me on this. Trust me, I'm your friend. I'm your good friendly neighborhood Let's Play YouTuber. Gah -huh. Gah -huh. I used to be really good at imitating Banjo's voice. I can't really do it anymore. Gah -huh. Gah -huh. Gah -huh. Whoa, ho ho ho. I don't even know what that was meant to be. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, people are probably glad I'm not a voice actor right now. But um, yeah, just get all the arrows and we'll eventually end up onto this platform over yonder, right by the shark jump pads, where we got, well, pretty much right by where we got one of the first gingers of the stage. And that big cross, but that, that looks like the final one, doesn't it? It looks awfully big in comparison to the others. Or is that my eyes playing tr Actually, I think it looks the same. My eyes must be playing tricks on me. But... Oh my god, it's a trap! Jeez, I wonder where it could be. I have no idea where we could look in order to find this one thing. The enemy has eluded... Oh, right, it's right below. Okay, then. <laughs> so jump onto this island and just ground pound it. This one is the final one. And just blow open the box. You can either use the charge blast or your jump peck move in order to break it open. You know, either or does good stuff. But um, that's pretty much all we can do now for the ground areas of this world. We've pretty much cleared out everything except for the sky area. What do we mean sky area? Well, obviously this takes place on a beach. Beaches usually have cliff sides and they're sometimes associated with lighthouses, are they not? Well, there's an entire... Is an entire extra level above the cliff, you know, folks, so just fly on up there if you want to. Of course, you might be wondering, where am I going? Well, honestly, I can tell you where I'm going right now. I'm going to look for that one honeycomb piece that's eluded me. I'm telling you, it's a nightmare trying to find this thing, just because... Watch now, what? just keep an eye on the ocean. I assure you it's out here, and it's very easy to find. 
Also, you can't fly out too far into sea because there's an invisible wall. I figured I should uh, just note that. Oh, oh, what's that? Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. It's... I love this game through and through, folks, you know, but I... That's like the ma the biggest problem I have with the game, honestly. If it weren't for that, this game would be... I would consider this a perfect game. <laughs> if it weren't for that one major drawback, I would honestly consider this to be a perfect game. Well, I say perfect, but there's no such thing as a perfect game, so as close to a perfect game as I can think of. But then again, there's the last of the Jinjos just on this one palm tree, so just pick him up and boom, we got 9 out of 10 Jiggies, which means the last Jiggy is quite obviously at the very top of this mountainside, right on top of the lighthouse, as you can probably imagine. And you might be wondering, where's the Gruntilda switch? Fret not, ladies and gentlemen, the Gruntilda switch is uh, it's, it, it's right in front of us, basically. Honestly, it's the, the last couple of collectibles in this stage are really easy to get. They're just right at the top, so... Here you go, Lighthouse, right behind it is the switch itself, and... We are very fortunate the cannon did not destroy the Jiggy in the process, because... That's a golden Jiggy. Isn't gold meant to be a really weak metal? Like, I, I'm pretty sure that if... If an explosion went off next to a bunch of gold, it would probably warp the gold because of the heat alone. I could be wrong with that. I'm no... I'm no scientist. Scientist? I'm... I don't know. I don't know metals all that well. I, I'm just probably talking about my ass right now. There we go. There's this world over and done with. We have collected every single MacGuffin we can in Treasure Trove Cove. And one thing uh, to, well, we are, obviously, we're gonna, I'm going to do some editing right now so I can just go straight back to the the beginning of the level, but Treasure, Treasure Trove Cove actually had a completely different soundtrack in the beta version of the game, as well as uh, Mumbo Mountain as well, actually. But uh, due to reasons, Grand Kirkhope had to change the soundtrack because I think apparently they didn't really... The music he had for the levels didn't really fit what the develop, what the lead designer of the game really wanted to go for in terms of style. So, I've heard the beta tracks; they're actually pretty good, you know. But I'm kind of glad they did the change because these newer tracks that Grant composed are a lot better, you know, they, and they really do suit the game a lot more. But uh, yeah, it's time to collect. Well, we've already collected the jiggy, so it's time to go on to the next level of the game, ladies and gentlemen. And unfortunately. The next level, I guess, can be classed as the water level of the game, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes! This early in the game, we're already treated to the water level. Oh. The, the, the sad thing is, this water level also doubles as a sewer level. Two game tropes that people usually dislike. But fret not, because even though two people... Two people? Even though most people don't like these two game tropes, Rareware did a good job in these levels. I assure you, these levels are amazing, the upcoming stage. So, with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. Don't be sheepish, people. And when we return next time, we'll be entering the dreaded Clanker's Cavern. Well, of course, we need to open Clanker's Cavern first, but we'll be opening it and entering it next time. So, thank you all for watching, people. Hope you all enjoyed. Don't be sheepish, and I'll catch you all next time. Bye!